This is Star Talk Sports Edition. Neil deGrasse Tyson here, your personal astrophysicist. And today we have as our guest Dale Earnhardt Jr. I got Chuck Nice. Chuck, how you doing, man? Hey, what's happening, Neil? All right, all right. Gary, Gary O'Reilly. Hey, Neil. Good the to one, see you again. The one who gives authenticity to this show as a former yeah. soccer pro in the UK. We have clips from my interview with Dale Earnhardt Jr. But Gary, you you mm. that wasn't enough for you. No. You, and I wasn't enough for you. No. The greedy. little bit of physics I put into conversation was not enough for you. No, no. So I needed something extra. <laughs> Okay. Just not anything, but something special and extra. And okay. so we we went out and found a, a friend of ours that we had back on the show many years ago, Dr. Deandra Leslie Pilecki. Undergraduate degrees in physics and philosophy, PhD in condensed matter physics, Neil. Mm, mm, um, loving it, loving it. Yeah, I knew this, this is definitely uh, for you. Researcher in magnetic, magnetic nanoparticles, focusing Ooh. on medical diagnosis and treatment, a science communicator, radio, TV broadcaster, an author of The Physics of NASCAR. Not only is Dr. Deandra an expert in NASCAR, but she is also working with NBC on their motorsports and has become co-opted into the Formula One family. So I think we have just the right person. Let's meet our dear friend, Dr. Deandra Leslie Pilecki. Deandra, welcome to Star Talk. Thank you for having me. I'm glad to be back. Oh, oh, you're back because when you were last on, I wasn't on that program. Uh -huh. So it's my yeah. first encounter with you. Yeah. And... Uh, and I guess if if you write a book called The Physics of NASCAR, that makes you pretty findable in our circles. So that it that, certainly that... does. Yes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. But so I, how do you I go... didn't know about the uh, the um, magnetic particle research for the purposes of medical diagnostics. Yeah, I'm getting. I just want to find out how she makes this transition. Uh, how do you go from there in medicine into NASCAR? What's up with that? Well, nanomaterials were actually one of the fields that uh, the public didn't understand. And when they first hit in, oh, I don't know, the 90s and the 2000s, those of us working in the field had to work very hard to explain to people um, what we were actually doing and the implications of what we were doing. So I learned a little bit more about how to communicate with the public then. But actually, the reason I got into the race cars was because I was teaching you know, the intro 101 basic physics and all of a sudden I realized I can teach all of this using cars. And oh. the kids would be a whole lot more interested than they would be if I'm doing balls rolling down inclined planes. Right. Yeah, frictionless inclined planes and, mm -hmm. and massless pulleys. On. Right, right. So, and and that was in the genesis of your book. It the was. And it's, actually, it's actually interesting because um, I always like to ask if there are physicists at the race shops. And one of the guys said, no, I don't think we have any physicists. You guys think everything interesting is negligible. <laughs> Ooh. Ooh. Uh, well, science put down. All right. All right. Well, let's get into our first clip with Dale. Um, uh, is he abbreviated D.E. Junior? Is this a, like in the know? Like if you're buddies with him, uh, I, you know, I, I want to be respectful. Oh, we just uh, call him Junior. Junior. <laughs> okay. No other junior. Just, just junior. There's, well, there is another junior, but he's in his 80s or 90s. So, yeah, if you say junior, y'all know who you're talking about. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. So, uh, I wanted to know, uh, we have several clips we'll bring in here, but let's start off. I wanted to know what was different about each car if each car f had, to f had to submit to regulations and size and and parameters, then what's the difference? Okay, and then Dale set me straight. Let's check out this first clip. NASCAR itself and stock car racing, for as for taking one example of motorsports that I'm familiar with, there's this long history of the, how the cars have changed and developed. But to your point, um, all of the cars are measured and and there's a technical inspection and they all have to meet the same measurements, requirements. And so how does a manufacturer differentiate itself from the others if they all have to appear, you know, measure the same body panels? Right. And, and how about the pistons? I mean, yeah. the pistons well, have to be the 
all all of the engines are uh there's there's a bunch of restrictions on how the manufacturers can build their motors and what's allowed to be able to um, create amount of, a certain amount of uh, they want to target on torque and peak torque and peak horsepower they don't want you to exceed or get outside of this box they want all of the manufacturers to live in this same sort of area so that no one has an advantage over the other and what seems con- you know it seems about to, that that would be conflicting to the true core of racing racing is building a fast car and building one better or faster than the next guy but and like i say i mean 50 to 75 years of history has you know created this massive sort of you know rule book with all kinds of restrictions and limitations and guidelines that everyone now has to fit into this tiny tiny little space deandra I, i'm so i'm confused I mean, i hear him but what how do you advance a sport if every time everybody's got it however clever your engineers are they got to make it a, a, they have to obey the rules and regulations set out about the design and then the and the aerodynamics the tires the, the the restrictions focus on one part of the car and not another and and whatever part they don't focus on do you have the freedom to make that part badass and then win every race like I'm just yeah. conf- this would, straight here. This these rules would ruin horse racing. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> it would. Um, so there's sort of two answers to that. One is that the reason for the, all the standardization is because what NASCAR doesn't want to happen is that the people who have the most money win, because uh-huh. then you just keep ramping everything up, Deidre, and all of a sudden, this America no one can afford. Deandra, this is a this is America. That's right. Okay. We like we like our races just like our elections. Whoever has the most money should win. <laughs> Whoever it. dies dies with the most toys wins. Yeah. And and we did that for a long time. And what happened was uh, people started dropping out of the sport. One driver, Martin Truex Jr., won the championship one year, and the next year his owner shut down everything because he just couldn't afford to keep doing the racing. And that's how you kill a series. And so a lot of the standardization was basically to save the series. Now, where the innovation has really come in is that NASCAR designed the car we're racing now, which is called the next-gen car. A lot of the innovation is there. And so the teams have a small area in which to work. They can change springs, shocks, suspension geometry. Um, You know, for example, when you stop at a stop sign, you go forward, right? Right. Right. Well, your entire car does that because the car is attached to the top of the car is attached to the wheels by springs. And so that's your suspension. Well, that transfers weight. And you know that the frictional grip you have depends on the weight pushing down on the tires of the car. So every time the part of your car goes backward, forward, to the side, you are changing the grip on your four tires. That is an incredible amount of freedom that the teams have. Now, Junior doesn't know that because he's not the one who's trying to figure out what springs and what shocks we use for a particular track. Hmm. So he doesn't see a lot of that. Um, And it's really a matter of how do you match the car setup, the suspension mostly, to a driver's style. Because you could put Junior in Hmm. one of those cars, you could put another driver in the same car, and one would be able to go faster than the other. And that doesn't necessarily mean one is better than the other, just that the car suits one driving style better than it does the other. So, Deandre, you're saying a car can have bespoke suspension for the driving style of the driver. So Deandra, let me ask you, let me ask you this. Has there ever been pushback from the teams where NASCAR have said this is what's going to come in as a restriction this season? And and they've all turned around and gone, nah, not happening. Has there ever been that? Or do they all do as they're told? Uh, a lot of the impetus for the standardization came from the drivers and the owners. Okay. Because imagine if you're a driver driving for a team that doesn't have as much money. Do you want to spend 36 weekends a year running, you know, 21st or 30th mm. just because you don't have enough money to make a car faster? Or do you want to have an equal platform and then you've got a better chance at showing off your skill because it's not the car that's winning, it's the driver who's winning. Mm-hmm. Okay. So when when you say that, when the restrictions come in, who who eventually ends up working the harder? The engineers in the pit or the drivers themselves because they've got to adapt and survive out there on the track? Good question. It really depends on the change. 
So some of the changes um, really affect the drivers more than the teams, but they're making a lot of changes. Uh, NASCAR is especially this year. Uh, they're trying out mufflers for the first time. They ran mufflers what? at the preseason race. They only muffled them down to somewhere around 80, 90 decibels from <laughs> oh, 110. Hey, hey, what, is, what is the I know. point? <laughs> well, the point is that they were racing at the LA Coliseum and uh, people live around there. Uh, and it makes okay. a huge difference, that 20 decibels to the wow. people who live outside. Okay, the NIMBYs, okay. the NIMBYs, yeah. all, all, all protested outside the Coliseum with placards. Let's yeah, go to my. But you couldn't hear what what chance they were screaming. <laughs> <laughs> Let's go to my next clip, where this notion that you're doing something to win the race, but in fact, innovation. Uh, you know, where does anything innovate? Are are, are, is, are the cars we drive on the street because some um, people are saying let's have innovations for the regular driver, or do they have? other origins so let's go back to my exclusive conversation with dale earnhardt jr on just that while everything is really tight in the rules there is this sort of little small area that the manufacturers tend to create advantages in for example right now the chevrolets would be um they would appear the chevrolets have a little bit of an advantage on a track that's a mile and a half in length and their nose and the, the other components on the body that they do have some liberty in allowed them to develop an advantage over the other two manufacturers. And that ebbs and flows back and forth as the manufacturers continue to develop and, and introduce new pieces. And so, so in, a, in, a, in a subsequent year, would other manufacturers copy that innovation? They might look at it and learn how to do it better. And that's sort of been. That's sort of been the way that this sport's evolved for 75 years is, you know, I'll make a better mousetrap than you. You'll look at my mousetrap and you'll right, figure out right. what I might have not seen and how they'll take my idea and improve on that. And it just continues to just layer, on, layer upon a layer on, on, upon layer of, of improvements to the same theories and ideas. So, so I heard that many, many uh, features of the modern internal combustion engine car owe their origin to innovations in NASCAR. And let me just mention a few. You tell me if I'm right or like fuel injection. I yeah. heard, was that was that first in NASCAR and car racing more broadly? Well, I think motor, right? motorsports more broadly. NASCAR yeah. actually hung on to the carbureted engine a little bit longer than most. I think, though, that fuel injection and those – you know, those types of improvements on our road automobile, the car me and you buy off the dealership floor, those those improvements in those cars certainly come from motorsports, seat belts, uh, safety innovation, and, um, you know, durability in suspension components. Uh, all of those things originate, originate from what we learn on the racetrack, the wear and tear and the, the durability and, we, you know, we'll put these components to the test and we find their weak spots. The, the, the manufacturers pay attention to that. They take that back to the car that me and you buy off the showroom floor. So, Deandra, there are test pilots. I love it. Is, is that a fair way to think of them? Um, in some ways it is. But, you know, NASCAR is much more of a reactive series. Um, if you look at the origins of, of motorsports, they came about when the cars first got invented and manufacturers right. were trying to convince people, these are good things. These are better than your horse and buggy, for example. Um, NASCAR has always been more about selling cars. And so there yeah. hasn't been as much innovation. However, um, they're very good at popularizing things. And so I think, for example, there is a material called uh, compacted graphitic iron, which is in between cast iron and um, ductile iron. And you know that engine blocks are made of cast iron usually. The problem is they tend to crack. Well, this material, which was invented in the 60s um, because we finally got metallurgy down to the point where we could actually make it, is a lot lighter. You can make much thinner features. And so, you know, one of the things as manufacturers turn to electric vehicles is they need to reduce the weight of the cars. So some of the materials, some of the tricks that racers have been using to decrease the car weight are things that will directly translate to production cars, especially as we move to electric vehicles. Mm. Wow. Mm. 
That's Are we at cool the place. limit of our innovations, Doctor with NASCAR? In the sense of, you know, with, with all the stuff we can see with the aerodynamics, you've talked about the engine blocks, we you know, we're gonna talk about tires in the next segment. And there's there's things on the floor of the car that are built specifically to to add to downforce. Are we are we at the limit or are we just beginning? Oh no, I mean what what is limiting us is money. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. How about you that? Know, so yeah, I mean <laughs> wind tunnel time. I was Deandre, gonna say, I, I could have said that, Dion. I didn't need you to on the show. Yes. <laughs> that that kind of that kind of translates across everything. Everything. <laughs> yeah, it does. It does. But you know, time in a wind tunnel is, you know, I don't forget how much it is now, about a thousand dollars an hour up, yeah. up in order to that. You know, that teams used to spend twelve hours in a wind tunnel, take the car back, strip it, and start over again. Yeah. And again, that but, kind of cost just keeps going up and up and up. But really, the um, the need for innovation changes from area to area, right? As as the needs of the consumer changes. So like you just said, right now, we are looking at the electrification of pretty much our entire economy. So now uh, the urgency for lighter materials more that are durable, that can stand up to, you know, the road. That becomes very, very important as b- before it was a luxury. Like to, to have carbon fiber in your car. To, oh, look how cool that is. Right, so cool. Right. Well, now it's like, yeah, you, you kind of need that. Mm. Yeah, exactly. And so a lot of the processing, figuring out how to make carbon fiber in extremely intricate shapes, for example, mm. a lot of that comes out of F1 and out of NASCAR. Yeah, yeah, cool. So, is there is there an area that the the engineers haven't really got heavily into yet, Doctor? In terms of where you think you know what, if we go there, we could really make something special happen. Um, yes, and it goes back to nanoparticles, um, Ooh. lubricants. So, one of the things you have to worry about is a cooler engine produces more horsepower, and Ooh. everything. I, I, and, why, know, would, why is that so? Um, because you get more air molecules in when the air is cooler oh, because it's denser, right? Oh, wow, look at that. Oh, you know that that is so simple. Oh, that is such a simple concept. Mic, mic drop right there. Oh, it's basic physics, yeah. right? Of yeah. course. So yeah, could so you put a, you could, could you put a little cooling thing in there to to shrink it back down? Or that would just well, be extra weight and Oh my God. That's the thing. Yeah. Um, if you were able to make fluids that could uh, transfer heat better away from the car, mm-hmm. you would have an advantage. Right. And the best part wow. is there'd be no way. I mean, F1 made a rule against nanomaterials. How are they going to find them? Honestly. <laughs> 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 you have a little magnifying glass. Uh, yeah, there you go. Oh, that's pretty funny. <laughs> A guy in a deer stalker, a, a guy right a deer stalker and a magnifying glass <laughs> going around the car. Priceless. However, however, you just made like, well, then again, we are moving away from combustion engines, but still, uh, I, I can't believe nobody's figured out a way to make a lubricant that actually cools the engine at the same time. So, like, it wouldn't just be motor oil. It'd be motor oil and some kind of additive some that extra would thing. bring the temperature down. Yeah. That yeah. would be amazing. Well, that's isn't way, that just a, to do with all the vents be... on the cars and the air vents, you know, not just for downforce, but as a, as a natural free coolant as yeah, you're yeah, traveling. 200 along. mile an hour air is going to cool stuff down. Yeah. Right? That's true. Well, yes and no. So the most important thing you have to keep cool in a race car is the driver. And uh, don't worry, headed, baby. I'm cool. Well, so they're <laughs> so they're the, you know we've really closed up the cockpits, and so the problem is it's getting to be 120, 130, 140 degrees Fahrenheit Ooh, in the car. Damn. And so we're now worrying about how do we keep the driver's temperature from getting up too high because when your temperature gets up high, you lose your ability to think correctly, and you know, you don't want to be doing bad at 200 miles an hour. No, so no. the other area of cooling is ways that you can uh, you. Know, force cooled fluid through a, a shirt or you know something more sophisticated than dumping a bag of ice down your fire suit at the next pit stop right right but of course and nasa them their spacesuits where there are there are there are tubes that move through that thread mm. the suit to particular areas where you can most benefit from a heat exchange uh if you're trying to stay warm mm. or, or cold either 
right? So yes. So that's interesting. I wonder. Yeah. If, and so if, drivers if, do have these shirts. They're called cool shirts. Very descriptive name. <laughs> that are just capillary tubes sewn there, onto there a is. shirt. But there the biggest is. problem they have right now is the capillary tubes tend to clog. Oh. And then you're stuck in the car with warm water going through the suit. Mm. So yeah. that's mm-hmm. an area, if you're going to start a business, that would be a really good area to go into. Mm. Yeah, we have, uh, he's a great driver, but we lose every race because he insisted that we put an air conditioner in the car. <laughs> 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 Wants to drive with the windows open. Right, and a yeah. stereo. <laughs> and, and a stereo, and a, right? Right. <laughs> <And a> stereo. <laughs> <laughs> Guys, we got to take a quick break, but when we come back, more of my exclusive interview with the one and only NASCAR legend, Dale Earnhardt Jr., supplemented by the physics expertise of Dr. DeAndra Leslie Pilecki, author of The Physics of NASCAR. Where else are we going to get that expertise but from her? We'll be right back. We're back. Segment two, Star Talk Sports Edition. Featuring my exclusive interview with Dale Earnhardt Jr. And we've got with us Dr. Deandra Leslie Pilecki, who wrote the book on the physics of NASCAR. Mm-hmm. And guess what that book is called? I'm going to go with the physics of NASCAR. <laughs> physics of NASCAR. All right. Something had me intrigued. I-, I heard that they don't inflate their tires with air. Air. Like air, the mixture of nitrogen and oxygen. Instead, they remove the oxygen and stick just nitrogen in the tires. And I'm thinking, why? Oh, my God. Check this out. We want um, the the heat that's created in the tire. I believe the nitrogen will be less affected by that temperature. And so this air is going to increase, right? And you're going to, as the tire gets hot and gets warmer, uh, the the size of this tire, we want to minimize the change in that tire from the moment it leaves the race, you know, leaves pit road and goes out on the racetrack and performs. And so they found a a mixture that would be less volatile, less affected by temperature. The tire, like the inside edge of a right front tire during a run, is going to go over 250 degrees, 280, 300 degrees. Whoa! And so, and so the air inside of the tire is affected by that heat. And as the air increases in the tire, the size of the tire changes. That changes the setup and the way the car drives and feels. Oh, and my so God. You want all of those things to be minimized. And so um, using nitrogen and and has gained the teams a bit control, a bit of control and um, predictability, I think, over just how much the tire is going to change. We, st- you know, we have a target pressure uh, working with uh, working with Goodyear. They give us a lot of tire data, and they'll tell us your, you know, the, your your target pressure for maximum grip and performance in the tire is going to be fifty five degree or fifty five pounds. And so, if the tire is likely to gain fifteen pounds in, you know, while out, what, in the race, in the race, yeah, while right. we're racing it, if it's going to gain fifteen pounds and and sort of plateau, then we want to pull off pit road with forty pounds of air in the tire. Whoa. And, yeah, and so there's, which is, uh, it's, there's not a lot of, there's not a, there's, it, most of the teams all understand where they need to be. There's not somebody out there that's smarter than the next guy trying, you know, that knows a little bit more and is doing that job a little better. Goodyear provides uh, all of the teams with tons of tire data on sidewall stiffness and all kinds of pliability and the rubber and everything else to help them understand you know, air pressures and what they need to run. And there's also a safety factor. Like if you start the air pressure too low, the tire itself will come apart over time. So DeAndre, I have a zillion questions after that (laughs) clip there. So first of all, are they, nitrogen is slightly lighter than oxygen. Is this why they're removing the oxygen and using primarily nitrogen? No, actually it's not. Um, what they want, so we call it a tire build. It's the difference between the tire pressure when you're on pit road and the tire pressure, you know, when you're just running green flag laps. That build, um, you want to be predictable. Now, imagine if you have just, say, compressed air, you know, and you put it uh, from a compressor into the tire. That air is going to have a lot of water in it. And you heard him say the temperature is going to get between 250, 300. 
Mm. Well, that's above the boiling temperature water, right? Yep. Ooh. So Ooh. what's going to happen is all of a sudden you're going to get a change in pressure. And that change in pressure will upset the car enough for a driver uh, to crash. So oh. what they found was that by using nitrogen, which is dry, has no oxygen, uh, has no water in it, rather, um, that made the builds more predictable. Wow. Wow. Damn. Okay, so so a couple of things. But under pressure, the water would, would turn to steam at an even higher temperature than 212. So maybe what, if it's getting up to 250, 260, maybe that's where 300 that is, is um, not out of the question. Not out of the question. For a tire. So, okay. So now I asked him, why don't they preheat the nitrogen before they put it in the tire? Then you don't have to build anything. You come out of the pit ready, you know, ready for prime time. And he didn't have a good answer for that. Do, do you have any insight into that? Oh, yeah. The answer is because NASCAR won't let you. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay. You know, honestly, that one I understand because I do not want people with compressed air cylinders, which, by the way, are sort of dangerous, heating right. them up. Right. <laughs> I mean, right. You're just oh, asking mm -hmm. for an accident. Yeah. Um, what I could go wrong? Say, what could go what wrong? What could yeah. possibly go wrong? <laughs> oh, the pit manatee. <laughs> I did, want to, I did want to mention um, that a couple crew chiefs every so often decide they're going to get really smart. And instead of using nitrogen, they decide they're going to use argon or xenon, oh. both of which are also ideal gases. Right. Um, and what they learn almost inevitably is that the additional cost is not worth any gain in performance. If you, if you go to gases down on the noble gases on the right-hand side of the periodic table, they really need to use krypton. That's the one. They, they haven't. Right. Yeah. Okay. Then you get Superman power out of that one. I'm pretty sure. <laughs> or, or, or at least your car won't have superpower anymore. Yeah. <laughs> oh, oh, kryptonite. Oh, that's the opposite. All right. Sorry, my bad. My bad. And obviously, right. it'll yeah. have to be green. Oh yes. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Goes without saying. Um, what, what if the tire pressure is too low? Because don't don't the tire don't you get to go quicker with lower tire pressure? But the the trade off is the integrity of the tire itself. Yeah, there's a hot, there's a happy pressure spot for a tire. Okay. If yeah. there's too little air in it, you'll actually see the sidewall start to flex. Yeah. And if you go to a track, a small short track, Martinsville, which is a half mile, they mm. will actually start the cars out between nine and eleven psi, Ooh. and they will build up to thirty five. 32 PSI during the course of a run. But if you started at 32, you'd get a build and then they'd be so big that you'd be having less of the tire in contact with the track, which would give uh, you less rip. Right, because so there's the, a happy tire... spot. Right, right, right. So I, we did a whole uh, explainer yep. video on the tire pressure. And the, if you multiply the weight of the car, sorry, if you, multi if you multiply the area of tires in contact with the road, by the tire pressure, you get the weight of the car. And so, yeah, if your tires get over inflated, they have to rise up on a center line there mm -hmm. so that all those all those numbers still come out. But believe so it or not, that's the same for your regular car that you're driving on the road. Every single person, you know, there's a recommended PSI for the for uh, and uh, for mm -hmm. the for the tire themselves. There's a pressure it has to be. And they tell you if you run it low, you wear your tires out. Uh, and if you run it on hot, the edges, yeah, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. so yeah, you it, it screws up the tread, right, right. But then again, totally. see, we always think of straight line speed and grip for a tire, but when you watch NASCAR, and I, I watched a couple of races just so as I can understand a little bit better, there's a lot of need for lateral grip. So if you overinflate a tire, it becomes too high a pressure, then that's where your loss comes in, surely. Oh, well, now now you got I me. Mean, that's this is where I want them to overinflate all the tires. Now you just made this game more exciting. <laughs> well, you're welcome. <laughs> Do we have a, a sweet spot for lateral grip? Because if I'm going to overtake or come underneath a, 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 a car in front of me, I'm going to need to have that lateral ability without just sliding all the way off. Yeah, lateral grip is actually much more important than the speed down the straightaways, for example. Um, so one of the problems is that if you are underinflated, when you turn, you can imagine you're actually shearing the sidewalls of the tire. Yep, mm. yep. And if it's I, way too low, you could actually shear them off the tire. 
Right. So that would be dangerous. And then if it's too high, you just simply don't have the grip to make the yeah, turn no and you're going to hit the wall. Look mm-hmm. at that. Well, so when you watch NASCAR and you think it's just about driving fast, right? And then I'm sitting down with Dale Earnhardt and have him sort of reflect on what's going on inside the driver's head, a good driver's head. And what is he thinking about? Is he just, do I, is it pedal to the metal or is there some other sort of thinking about the engineering and physics? I know one thing he's thinking. What? Damn, it's hot. Oh, okay. Let's find out. Let's find out what else the driver is thinking from this next clip. Let's see what's going on. Check it out. In our racing, since we drive on ovals and we are always turning left and we're always going in the same direction, we really need the right side of our car to perform almost like a wing on an airplane. And how do you, if we have a car that's tracking straight down the straightaway, uh, if we can control how much y'all the y'all movement or how much the car goes into y'all into the corner, and almost you know it almost is the car pivots into y'all into the corner, that right side becomes a wing. The air now is pushing on that right side, trying to straighten the car out. That means I can go faster. I can mash the gas and go harder. And so we control the y'all movement, and we. Focus on side force or the amount of air pushing on that right side of the car, trying to keep that car from spinning out and losing control. And, uh, you know, that, that's been, that's really been the main focus in NASCAR and oval track racing probably over the last two decades. Uh, he was saying y'all, right? Y A W, not y'all. Yeah, I know. I thought he was talking about the people's watching. <laughs> y'all watching the thing. I'll be okay. about to. Pitch in the y'all. <laughs> Pitch it in. So yeah, he's using he's using terms from aerodynamic flight airplanes and aerodynamics. So so can you comment on that, Deandra? Yeah. So uh, the aerodynamics of a race car are really important. And what he's talking about is you know you have a car and it's coming straight towards you, and if the car is in zero yaw, the tires are both lined up straight like this. It's actually better if you're turning left, it's better for the car to be a little bit like this. So the right side's poking out. That means that you're going to get more air coming along the right side of the car. That's going to give you side force. That's going to help you turn. And so, you know, everyone has pretty much the same mechanical grip, but is the weight of the car. So anything you can do to increase your aerodynamic grip will give you more speed. Mm. Whoa. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So could I design the right-hand side of the car in a slightly advantageous way to build Ooh. that out, to kind Ooh. of make it naturally be doing yeah. that? Right. Or, or, to... or am I now in trouble with the big people? Oh, you're an aerodynamic car. cheater. He's a cheater, Let's... aerodynamics. Mm-hmm. Let's say that you came up with something that actually accomplished that and was left in the rules. Yep. The NASCAR would probably make it illegal right after that race. Oh. After you won, you have to win the race first. Of course, before they make it. Oh. If he came in dead last, I'm they would getting, say, yeah, I'm getting laughed out of town. If say, I, uh, <laughs> why, why is this NASCAR shaped like a rhombus? What is going on? <laughs> <laughs> so also, I think they Doctor, that. Go on. yeah, okay. I mean, all right. We've seen the drafting. We've seen ridiculously close drafting. We've seen them in the single file. We've seen them three abreast. But when they're racing. And in different stages and different positions, are there is there a sweet spot, or are there at times multiple sweet spots which the drivers themselves can exploit? To you mean gain? location among other cars, Gary? Say it again. A sweet spot as a sweet spot. You mean location among other? Yeah, cars? Yeah, where all of a sudden okay. the the aerodynamics are more beneficial for the car trailing. Oh. So is uh-huh. is that kind of? I mean, there's all sorts of thoughts that go off in your mind once you start to watch one of these things. Yes. The the question of how the air coming off another car affects your car is one that has been with NASCAR ever since draft drafting was discovered in the 60s. Yeah. Um, it's almost more of a question of making sure you're not in certain places. Yeah. So when you get right behind someone, if you get to one side, in fact, we saw this at, at Atlanta this week, uh, one driver just actually moved behind the other from right to left and the driver in front spun out. There was no contact. No, I but saw it that. Changed the right. air wow. yeah, so much mm, yeah. that it made him spin out. Oh man, he 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 did a draft pit move on him. <laughs> wow, damn. Okay, so with the outer wall, how is that affecting? Apart from the fact you don't want to be hitting it, 
How is that affecting the aerodynamics on the cars that race closer to the wall as opposed to those inside of the track? So if you're running the outer wall, you're at a slight disadvantage because you're going a longer distance, right? Right, right, okay. However, if you're running the outer wall, some drivers um, can take advantage of sort of the cushion of air between the car and the wall Mm -hmm. and pick up a little speed that way. Now, you have to have some guts to do that because the closer you are to the wall, the less tolerance you have for air. Wow. All right, so what's interesting there, if because if the more you draft and the more you become efficient, the maybe you could work it so that it's one fewer pit stops to refuel. That can make a very big difference, can't mm-hmm. it? It can, uh, and also it's going to depend how many cautions there are in a race. So, you know, you load up a, f- a full tank of fuel, how many laps you get is going to depend how many of those laps are green and how many are yellow, because obviously you get better fuel mileage when you're not going as fast. Wow. Okay, damn. I, 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 who, who thought, did, how, did, do all the, do the fans know all these details that are going on, or they just want a fast race and an occasional crash? No, they don't. Yeah. Some know, some aren't interested. I mean, that's the great thing. Um, I was out at Las Vegas two weeks ago, just going out and talking to fans about some of this stuff. And a lot of them really want to understand, why isn't my driver winning? What's happening? Why did he crash here? Mm. So that's the great thing about using motorsports to get people interested in math and science. They want to know. Yeah, I have one friend who's in the NASCAR and he's, you know, he's obsessed. So like he's with all this stuff that we're talking about and... Uh, there's something wrong with him though because he actually <laughs> I'm serious he has an autographed tire slick that he uses as a, a coffee table like he's okay. in that right. so he's, he's in he's that in space in okay. you know all right all right so what are you doing are you critiquing him because of his interior design or are you yeah, critiquing apparently. him because he likes NASCAR? Well, first of all, he thinks I'm gay because I don't have a tire slick as a coffee table. <laughs> so that should let you know where, uh, where we, he's coming from. Uh, uh, what different la- wavelengths we are. <laughs> oh, we got to take a we got to take a Please break, say, but yeah. we're, we're gonna come back with Deandra Leslie Pilecki telling us about the physics of NASCAR. And in the final segment, I look forward to just learning about the transition to electric. Uh, any other thoughts and physics insights that are going on in that fascinating sport when Star Talk Sports Edition continues? We're back, Star Talk Sports Edition, featuring my exclusive interview with Dale Earnhardt Jr., otherwise known as Jr. And we've got deep physics insight coming to this episode from Dr. Deandra Leslie Pawecki, who wrote the book The Physics of NASCAR. You know, I asked him about going electric. And if you go electric, then there you might have aerodynamic noise, but you don't get that engine noise. That engine noise that is so characteristic of the sport. And so I had to ask him about it. What what happens if the music goes away and it's just silent running? Check it out. I think their ambitions are absolutely there. I don't know that there's concrete plans of what that looks like, but they know that as you know, there's an adage or a or a phrase that we used to say all the time uh, in racing in NASCAR, and that was win on Sunday and sell on Monday. And what that meant is the car, the manufacturer that would typically win on Sunday, they would go. They were going to have a good day at the dealership on Monday. They were going to. Oh, wow. Yeah. Oh so my gosh. Ch- if Chevrolet was successful on the racetrack, their belief, the reason why they're in motorsports in general is to sell automobiles. And so if their sedan that they're trying to sell to the market is doing well on the racetrack, then more people are likely to buy that car. And right. so um, that still has some truth to it. Now, the race car that I'm right, you know, that we race on the racetrack isn't anything like you're going to buy off the showroom floor, but um, you know, we still, we still sort of adhere to that idea that, um, you know, the manufacturers, their, po- their whole purpose is to raise, you know, the profitability of their, of their, yeah. uh, why not? Business. Why not? Of course. Did it. Yeah. And yes. so, yeah. yeah. And if they're, and if they're building hybrids and they're building and, and studying how to build electric cars, fully electric cars, 
then we too need to adapt some of that technology. We need to make it, we need to be a, we need to be a place where the manufacturers want to be, to be able to showcase right. that technology. Because just like we talked about at the start of this conversation, if hybrids is the future, and if if fully, uh, you know, fully electric cars are the future for the consumer, then where are they going to tr- truly test that technology? Where are they going to put that technology to the ultimate test? That's on the racetrack. Mm-hmm. That's our belief, and I believe it's the manufacturer's belief as well. Plus, uh, I own an electric car, and as you surely know, they have very high acceleration, right? Yes. It's just it, massive it, torque. Very, very high torque at low speeds. I mean, every so that's an interesting feature that could manifest in interesting ways yeah. for races designed just for that kind of car. Right? I think that that's true. And another conversation is what will be fascinating to me is as hybrids become more commonplace in motorsports, we lose that combustion engine sound, the bra- you know, the engine braking of mm-hmm. uh, decel, decel into the corner, the sound of the RPMs accelerating out of the corner. We, as I say, we race car drivers listen to those noises to determine whether we are at above or beyond the level of grip, right? Or we're we're over accelerating, over over um, we're over put or pushing. It's talking to you. The sounds are talking to you. Yeah, and so when that's gone, when you get into an electric car, you lose some of that. You lose some of the understanding of what that combustible engine is telling you. I think that's going to be so fascinating watching. Drivers that are that have sort of lived both worlds, right? So, DeAndre, do you foresee electric NASCAR anytime soon? Yes, uh, the current generation of car they designed with the intent of eventually being able to add hybrid features to it. And Ooh. what Junior said is exactly correct. Man- the manufacturers are in NASCAR to sell cars. Right. When they're trying to sell electric cars, NASCAR will be racing electric cars. Mm. I-, I think the important thing there is that NASCAR is in a position to change people's minds. And mm. so the people who now say, I hate electric cars, may get used to it, may change their mind about electric cars based simply on you know NASCAR adopting them. So, Deidre, I just had an idea. All right. Have you ever seen lowriders that move into town real slow? It, yep. If you want to sell lowriders, you got to have a slow NASCAR <laughs> 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 that are bobbing up and down and they're just slow and they're there to be looked at as you drive by. That's a Actually, new kind of NASCAR. Gary, isn't Formula One having that problem with the porpoising? Yeah, maybe it is, but uh, I don't think anyone's buying a Formula One car out of a showroom. <laughs> 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 <Any time>. <laughs> <laughs> hey, I must ask you, what you heard there with, with Dale Earnhardt Jr. was the relationship, the, the, the intuitive relationship of sight, sound, and vibration, everything. If the NASCARs are now electric, does that relationship get broken between driver and vehicle? And how how are we going to solve that problem if that is now going to be a problem of the future? So they no longer become one with their car? No. Oh, I don't think so. Um, so there's two ways that the drivers are sensing things in their car. One is eyes, ears, well, right? Mm-hmm. And the other, and that's where sound will come in. The other one, however, is through their, their butt, basically, is they're feeling how the balance of the car is shifting as they're, you know, as you lose fuel, you lose rear grip, for example. Right. As your tires wear, you lose grip. They feel that in the seat and mm. have to adjust accordingly how fast they go to make sure they're not exceeding the limits of grip. So that will still be there with the electric cars. Uh, I've talked to drivers who have driven both and they say it is a very different a technique to make an electric car go fast than it is an ICE car. But when when they rely on that engine rev as an audible clue as to where they are in terms of the power output, in terms of when they need to make the maneuver, if that's just how you, how you how do you tap into that as a driver? Lights lights on the dashboard. Yeah, so it's the same have, way they, they go have meters. Yeah, they they, they yeah. have a. Um, uh, what are they called? Well, it's, a he- it's not a heads-up dashboard yet, but it's an electronic, a digital dashboard. Mm. Yeah, and yeah. so they can pull it up. They can see the RPMs. They can see how close they are to pit road speed. They can see diagnostics for the engine. But the I engine don't want to. This, this be- is like Luke. This is like the thing that Luke was was going to use. Oh, uh, the thing didn't. that came down. Yeah. Yes. yes, right. Trust the force, Luke. 
trust and then he, then he, and pulled he, it then away. he pulls it away and he pulls right. it away and then you hear r2 going what are you doing you idiot <laughs> look at all this technology how would you trust the force wait 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 r2 doesn't speak well, you know, how, why, how, Luke understands. Chuck was interpreting <laughs> Neil. <laughs> Luke understands him. I don't want you to embarrass me on my show by not knowing that R2 is not having a conversation. No, here's the thing. I mean, you got to suspend it's... so much disbelief <laughs> in order to accept anything with Star Wars. And you got to draw the line at the talking robot. <laughs> okay. Uh, okay. Andrew, please continue. Okay, so, uh, Sorry, okay, that, us. Now, my problem with this is if I go to reach the radio while I'm driving on a on an empty road, I have a concern. I don't want to be on a NASCAR track with 20 other cars at 200 miles an hour going, oh, what does that heads up display say? What was that again? And I don't oh, need to oh, be looking true. there when I need to be looking there. So surely that audible note allows me to focus with my eyes and use this other sense here. You know, it definitely with, does. It definitely but, does. It's something they'll are, have to learn. There, there are other things that become intuitive as you drive. Uh, and I only say this, not that I've ever driven NASCAR, but I, I ride motorcycles and the same thing happens. There is no instrumentation when you're riding 95 miles an hour uh, or, on a, on a right. twisty road. You don't ever look at instrumentation. But also at that speed, a lot of your hearing, which you rely on to uh, listen to the motor, is also uh, impaired because of the rush of wind. Yeah. And mm -hmm. so you find other ways to feel the road, to feel the bike. To You know you're at a certain speed when you go to turn and because it's a gyroscope, there's a certain amount of force that you need to use in order to pull the bike. In. So I, without ever looking down or hearing the engine, I know, oh, I'm above 50 miles an hour right now going into this turn from how much force I have to pull on the, on the bars to pull the bike down into a turning position. So these are all things that you just, when you are deprived of any sense, you find another way to sense the circumstance. That's that's all I'm saying. Let, let's let's jump into another clip of my exclusive interview with Junior. Uh, Andrew, can I call him Junior? And I, am I allowed? Everyone and calls him a, Junior. Ever, good. Thank you. Thank you. I don't want to be uh, out of order here. So, um, uh, of my exclusive interview with Junior, where we talked about safety, safety, and he said safety is not a destination. And so I wanted to know how safe is NASCAR these days? So check it out. There is a lot of subtle things. Um, the, you know, the, the, the wheel tethers, like you say, the, there's, there's tethers to the hoods of the cars so they don't go flying into the grandstands when they come removed from the cars and crashes. But um, there's been a lot of things. There is this um, safety is, a, is not a destination. And, you know, okay. there's, no, there's no end game. We, I, Neil, when I was driving cars in 1995, I thought those cars were as safe as they could be. And, and, and it's miles from where we are today and what we've learned and what we've, you know, what we, well, it's not just the car. Isn't your head now yeah. attached yeah. to, so, because your yeah, head is this a, thing on this, on this thing yeah. we call a neck and yeah. your head is moving 200 miles an hour, right? Yeah. People yeah. aren't thinking, they thought oh, it's the car. No, your head. Is yeah. moving two hundred dollars, and the car stops. Your head keeps going. Yeah, and that's you know that's uh, that's a fatal injury. That's part of my own my father's uh, injury that caused him to lose his life. Uh, the basal skull fracture is is something we heard a lot in in years past. But when the Hans device comes out, which was developed because of of the many drivers like my father that had this injury, um, the Hans device basically kind of keeps your head from coming off of your shoulders in those high, high speed regs. And so, you know, I also learned, you know, we've learned a lot of about the, uh, the head surround, which uh, the padding around the helmet itself to try to protect, protect drivers from concussions, which, uh, which I know a lot about myself, unfortunately. DeAndre, does it, does it take a tragedy to introduce a safety feature? I mean, it kind of seems like it does, but must it? I guess I'm asking. 
in some ways it does because there are always things that can happen that you want to pre- that you, you can't predict. So, for mm-hmm. example, one of the things we thought at one point was the stiffer a car was, that is, the less give it had, the safer it was. So you were you were enclosing the driver in a cage that would not allow him or her to you know get any of that energy. Well, it turns mm-hmm. out you want a car stiff but not too stiff. And so we're still learning about how stiff to make a car, for example. Um, so we went through the same thing with safety belts. Uh, the problem is, if you are studying motorsport safety, you don't get a lot of data points every year. So there are, you know, less than 30 serious accidents in NASCAR. By serious, I mean, you know, someone hitting a wall really hard, uh, someone going upside down, catching on fire. We don't have a lot of those. So if you're trying to study how to prevent them, you just don't have the data to be able to predict everything that's going to happen. Oh, so that's a good problem then. It you, is you, and you it is data on. <laughs> You don't have the data on bad accidents because there aren't bad accidents, right? I mean, that's kind of interesting. Well, there are bad accidents, but there aren't enough of them that you could, you know, it's like if you have an incomplete data set and I ask you to predict mm. something from yeah. that, it's you're hard. not going to be able to predict everything. Mm. You can't. Okay. But if you take the element of danger away, are you not then affecting the certain bit of something that attracts the crowds Ooh. to uh, He's the talking track? about me. He's being oh. polite. He's saying, oh. if you take the, uh, I'm potential, you, Chuck. the potential of death out of the sport, don't you get rid of the macabre uh, people like Chuck Nice who just love to, don't want to see anybody get hurt, but are thrilled by the potential of it happening? Maybe. <laughs> uh, you may, but you know, there's a whole other group of people who have no interest in that. Look at look at sports car racing. They very rarely have accidents. Right. And mm. there's a whole slew of people who follow that. Yeah. 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 Uh, and listen, I, I think that uh as long if nobody gets hurt, crashes are spectacular. But mm-hmm. what you want to see at the end of it is when the guy gets out <laughs> and they walk. And they walk yeah. away. And they walk. Like yeah. and they walk. that that is the happiest you can be. It's like you saw this spectacular crash. And then you saw a guy get up and walk off, and you know, and it, he, and it looked and it looks back at it. right. He's looking back right, just in the, the middle yeah. of that, yeah, like yeah. you know, there, you know, but because it's really, I mean, there's, I mean, we we went through it in the in the NFL this year. We actually saw an ambulance take a player off of the field first mm. time, and God knows how long that's happened. And it was really just kind of almost like a you you, you felt, it was like a national tragedy. Because it's something about that shared experience of seeing yeah. it all mm-hmm. together. It was awful. It was just awful. So you just mm-hmm. never want to see it. So for me, Neil, the chilling words by Dale Earnhardt Jr. there at the end, concussion, that's something I know a lot about, unfortunately. Um, right. From your discussion, and we've not got into hearing him say this, but he is going to donate his brain to science mm-hmm. once he passes away because of the concussions he has. <laughs> Yeah, I know a little fine devil's in the detail there. So it's right. that sort of thing where you're saying people need to know that much more. And so to your point, Doctor, the data points are going to come from a whole lot of different sources, not just from the cars themselves. Most definitely. And in fact, one of the things Junior has done already, including in addition to donating his brain, mm. is just speaking out and getting out of the car when he had a concussion and telling people, look, I, it's not safe to drive when you have a concussion because there is that, you know, macho, you know, mm. I'm going to have a broken jaw and drive. I'm going to have a broken arm and I'm still going to get in the car. He really changed a lot of people's attitudes about that. Yeah. And so he's done a great service to the sport that way. So Gary, I think we have an extra clip on. We do. On, we do. On, on, so on brain uh, research. Mm-hmm. So let's, see, let's see what's going on there. Check it out. I feel like that, um, There's been a bunch of studies on NFL football players and other athletes as well. There wasn't anybody really in the motorsports industry that was looking at this and and thinking and considering donating their brain. Oh, so that came Uh, after the football awareness. The research. Yeah. Yeah. I saw all of that happening and saw the, the, you know, the groundswell support to try to provide anything for research, right. To move, to move this further. I met with a lot of doctors in my own rehabilitation that I fell in love with and really respected. And I wanted to help them and do the right thing as well for them well beyond my life. I wanted to continue uh, to be an advocate for um, helping other people. And so 
you know, anything they can learn from my experiences and and anything they can learn from anything that I can do post post my life, I will, you know, after I'm gone, I would I would want to be able to do that. I I um so yeah, that was a very easy decision for me. Yeah, I'm glad we we had that clip. So mm-hmm. that really that completes the the picture of this treasure, this American treasure, Dale Earnhardt Jr. And what he's done for the sport, and what he'll continue to do for the sport, even in death. Uh, Deandra, do you have any sort of uh, closing remarks you can give us, based on all you've heard and what you know, and your wisdom and insight? So I really enjoy listening to drivers talk physics because when they talk the science of the racing to people like us, they feel compelled to use you know the right words and talk about aerodynamics and that. But what's really fascinating is that they have an experience of physics that you and I don't have Mm -hmm. because they have all the G forces, all the turning, you know, all the, all the feelings that you get driving a car. And I think it's a really great way to sort of merge these two worlds. And I'm really glad you talked to Junior because I think he's one of the great ambassadors of the sport. So we learned as well. Mm -hmm. Uh, uh, It's been a delight, Deandra, to have you back on Star Talk. Where do we find you? What's your social media footprint? Uh, I am at Dr. Deandra on Twitter. I am at Dr. Deandra 2 on Instagram. And I think you can find my my page, my website, Building Speed. It's buildingspeed.org. That's where I put most of my really technical stuff about motorsports. But then again, I also I write two columns a week for NASCAR Talk for the NBC um, Sports. And you'll find things on there that cover everything from uh, things that we talked about today with the tire to the odds of, you know, someone winning the Daytona 500. Woo. Wow. Okay, right. so that's the math and the physics coming coming through there. It's been a delight. Thank you for giving your time to us and our uh, sports loving audience. Always good. thank you for having me. All right, Gary, good to have you, man. Pleasure, my friend. All right, Chuck. This has been another episode of Star Talk Sports Edition, the Dale Earnhardt Jr. interview. Neil deGrasse Tyson here, as always, bidding you to keep looking up.